Welcome, everybody, to the Film Consortium Podcast. We are back again. Yay. You're here with your host, Derek Acosta, and the president of Film Consortium, Jody Silly. Thanks for having me Hi, Jody. again. Yeah, I guess this officially makes you co-host. I'm going to be your co-host. Okay. Let's call it. <laughs> Our first guest has been promoted to co-host, and we're here with uh, filmmaker Lawrence Rock. Hi, Lawrence. Hey, everybody. Hi, Lawrence. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited um, to be here. In the Mega 64 you. Studios. It's so eclectic and colorful here. So, Lawrence is a two time feature filmmaker, currently in production on your third film. Um, yeah, what do you, how would you introduce yourself to the people, Lawrence? <laughs> Exactly how I did Short it. Short yet sassy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a lifelong filmmaker. You know, I, I started when I was 19 and, and uh, I put my, uh, my entire life's existence uh, at, a, at a young age, uh, uh, put, it, put it against uh, having a film career. So it's been paying the bills for a long time. Very and, cool. Uh, and love doing it, you know, in, in all way, shape or form. And uh, so I've kind of like evolved from uh, shooting snowboarding and skateboarding videos back in the 90s to uh, doing news, uh, shot a lot of weddings, was a news reporter for Fox and CBS in Central California, SPCA telethons, music videos, everything. But my, uh, my love was uh, feature filmmaking. So now that I'm making features, I'm happy where I am. Just want to keep going. Excellent. So for the people listening... Um who aren't familiar with their whole body of work, starting from the present and working backwards. You're currently in production on a film, but a few years ago, you had a Western released. Uh, yeah, it was, um, I was uh, very honored to shoot and direct um, a $6 million movie up in Canada called Diablo, which was Scott Eastwood's first Western, uh, assuming that he may do more. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. We got Diablo to kill too. Danny Glover. And spoiler. I'm just, I'm just bummed. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. Spoiler. <laughs> we'll just have to warn people ahead of time. Sorry, everybody. Well, you know. Um, it's out there now. I directed the movie. It doesn't mean I'm, it's already I'm on remembering Twitter. it correctly. So it could <laughs> very well be wrong and I could be messing. That's with right. It. That credit after the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Danny comes crawling. I wish back. you guys were around when I was shooting that. It would have been so fun to share that movie with you. It was such an experience. I can't yeah. believe it snowed. It looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I watched Diablo the other night, and I thought I really liked what Jody mentioned, like the snow, the scenery. There was a real sense of like movement and time. You know, it like take place in the snow, and then they moved into kind of springtime. It just felt like a had this like sprawling. Yeah, in yeah. that aspect, it was organized. Beautiful shots. <laughs> so you planned for that. You ordered that snowstorm, right? I did not. Oh. In fact, the snowstorm almost gave me a, a heart attack. I'm sure. <laughs> but, you know, the funny thing is, is oddly enough, like once it really started dumping and, and it snowed like a foot every day for like four, four days. So we had four feet of accumulation. And um, we were shooting all these scenes on top of a mountain, which made sense because it was like uh, chronologically in the story. Because, you know, you, when you shoot a movie, you don't shoot it in chronological order. So that was my big worry, that I would snow all over my film and wouldn't be able to justify it. So luckily, luckily, we were um, following chronological order of the story at that time. And Scott Eastwood was riding his horse up into the mountains. And that um, first ride into the mountains was when the snow started. And then the snow stopped and actually was subsequently melted away by rain on the fourth day when he got down to the valley bottom. So I was lucky and I mm. got big snow sequences from that movie um, without having to plan for it. And it's just mm. mother nature just lent a hand. How cold know? was it out of curiosity? Um, I would say, you know, uh, minus, wow. Minus, you know, five degrees. Below like zero. Below zero. below zero. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Canadian crew, which is pretty adept in shooting in snow, we had uh, like two full-time tow trucks uh, hired because we were just pulling people out of, the, out of the ditch. Everybody was driving into the ditch. But oh the, director, the director stayed on the road, though. Nice. You didn't drive for him. into a ditch? No, that's not my thing. 
Okay, good. Uh, too many years of towing snowmobiles through the backcountry. Well, luckily you had your background in like snow snow videos, so that must have given you some peace of mind. Yeah, it just calmed me down a little bit once it really started dumping, and I and I because I was just worried that the trucks wouldn't be able to roll, and so the unit production manager um, at that time said, "No, we're we're used to this. We'll have some problems with the tow truck and people kind of um, you know driving into the ditch and that sort of thing." But we 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 got through it. Uh, did it remind you of your snowboard video days or not? Yeah, it did. It did did in a weird sort of way. Draw on that experience. Yeah. I mean, there was a certain, certain aspect of that, uh, just being up on top of the mountain, you know, in the snow and it was fun times because, you know, that was 2014 and, uh, drones really hadn't come into their own. So I was Mm. like literally one of the first people you know, directing their own movie and shooting drone shots and flying it through the snow. And that, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed enjoyed that movie. And, and for me, too, the main um, enjoyable aspect of that film is the kind of the scenery, being out in the woods, the loneliness of one character, and seeing his sadness and, and mental instability kind of unravel throughout the film. Um, I personally, you know, I'll have to say that it was Scott Eastwood that really dictated the elements of that story. And I'm personally a little bit more of a hopeful filmmaker than Diablo. So you'll probably find that Diablo will huh. be my darkest movie ever. Mm. Your darkest film ever. The black yeah. sheep of your <laughs> collection. Yeah, like The Forger, the first one. I mean, that was kind of more, you know, it was a Josh Hutcherson, Hayden Panettiere movie, the, my first movie. But that was very hopeful and had a real warm ending and... I kind of like uh, I like I like uh, a little bit of hope in my stories. Yeah. So Diablo felt counter counterintuitive to what I normally would like to direct. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about the Forger as well. Your first film, just to let everybody at home know, working backwards through all the things you've created. So Diablo was the western, and then you made um, sort of drama or romance or coming of age story. What would you yeah, call it was the a, Forger? Yeah, it was a coming of age uh, international art forgery drama romance. You know, <laughs> all it had all those is. elements in there. I mean, it was about a fifteen-year-old boy a boxes. who was a very um, he was a very talented artist. Mm-hmm. And he uh, he could paint anything he wanted to, but he had a really messed up family life. His mom was a heroin addict. She had abandoned him. He was essentially homeless, yeah. and um, so it was interesting. in in that way, it was a coming of age story. Uh, Where'd you get a boy that story? Kind of figuring it out. That's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, it's not based on uh, a childhood friend, but I did have a childhood friend that was copying and forging paintings that did live with me. So I wouldn't give him the credit for being the influence on the story, but some of the elements of that experience of having that friend and what he did and, and you know, he stayed with my family for a little bit, um, really influenced it. So it's from Carmel by the Sea. From, mm-hmm. from, uh, it's really the story in a weird sort of way is emblematic of that town. Carmel is um, such an interesting um, place people don't really realize that in 1906, uh, right after the San Francisco earthquake, mm-hmm. it was the number one most creative town in the world. There were more manuscripts, more paintings, more great works of art coming out of Carmel than anywhere else. Wow. And they still, to this day, uh, teach a class in French University about the early California artistic Bohemians. They were called the Bohemian Club. And um, that is directly related to the modern Bohemian Club, which is now like presidents, former presidents of the United States and owners of GM and all these big corporations get together every year um, at a place up in Marin, uh, a camp, uh, camping area, and it's called the Bohemian Club. But that original Bohemian Club that's directly related to that new one was, was artists and some of the best creators in the world. So... To get to the point of my story, (laughs) how Carmel reflects the forger is, you know, the forger is about a 15 year old kid that's copying paintings and selling them in this in this artsy town. And Carmel was such a real thing back in the day. It was a real artistic outlet for some of the best artists in the world. But now it's all cheap art galleries. It's Mm. like really schlocky kind of tourist 
uh, tchotchkes that you buy oh, on the street, yeah. you know, uh, coach leathers there, uh, Tiffany's. And so what was once, you know, this amazing creative art town, uh, you know, literally one of the most creative art towns in the world is now a tourist, uh, you know, outpost on the California coast and is known more for golf and fancy French yeah. dinners. So it's interesting, you know, the movie kind of mirrors that. There's a fakeness in Carmel uh, to this day that used to not be there, you know, 80, 100 years ago. Yeah. I think that could be said for most artistic communities. There's a lot of good culture coming out of a spot, and so it turns into a tourist attraction. Because well, the money bit. gets involved and people. Start. Yeah, because it's pretty. Like artists yeah. are, are artists are very um, drawn to beautiful places and unique places to live and unique cultural places. And then when the artists come there and then they make the fa place famous, then the money comes in. <laughs> and we've seen that, you know, throughout. Throughout history, and all yeah. money homogenizes cool. everything, and money so it homogenizes. creates yeah a lot of commercialism and in art instead of just so sort of spirit of art. Uh, your first film, The Forger, um, and Diablo are very different films. Mm -hmm. Very, very different. Um, Diablo is dark, like you said. It's one of your darkest films, or may go on to be your darkest film. Um, but I noticed that personally, and maybe I'm reading into this, but I felt like there was a similarity in the films, especially in the main characters of the films. Mm. I thought that I could see potentially a theme of um, these guys who weren't fully aware of their capabilities, if that makes sense. Like Josh Hutchinson in The Forger uh, is this great artist, but kind of doesn't know what to do with it, you know, and, and is still. I love underdog stories. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to ask. Yeah. Like, uh, are, are these themes intentional? Are there certain stories that you're attracted to in your films? Because even though these movies are so different, there's this similarity um, in the characters. Um, that's a good question. I feel like um, I, I like stories where people are searching for like their true meaning of their life and what they should do and what they should be. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just a natural thing. Like when you're a filmmaker, you don't just wake up one day and you're like, I'm a filmmaker. You know, you, you're searching for some kind of deeper meaning and you're attracted to either the arts or art or, you know, photography or storytelling or writing. And so you're seeking out, you know, who you are as a person constantly and also to the world around you is telling you don't be an artist you're gonna like my parents told me they're like don't go into art like you're screwing your life up like going to real estate you'll do really well yeah and so i think that that really bleeds into the characters that i write you know um um josh hutcherson in the forger he was looking for love and he had no sense of family and no sense of belonging and he found that in in this little town of carmel by the sea and and decided to become a, a legitimate artist and follow his artistic uh, integrity. Spoiler alert. And, uh, <laughs> We're spoiling all Lawrence's films today, so. No, that wasn't a spoiler, was it? Said, no. Well, I mean, if he was forging, he decided to, anyway. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Thank you, Jody. Well, whenever I um, start spoiling, just you just pinch me. <laughs> just, yeah, or just elbow me. That's hard to <laughs> But anyways, um, I don't know, Jody, like, you know, you're, you're the head of an organization of many, many, many filmmakers here in San Diego. Do you feel like a lot of the stories that they tell are, are autobiographical? I mean, some of the best ones are, you know, the ones that people can, uh, that come from people's own experiences. And that's something that uh, is, it feels authentic to people when they watch it, usually. So I, some of the best ones, I think, come from our own, you know, backgrounds and our own things that we care about. Like I always care, I've always cared about you know, social justice type of themes yeah. and like underdog stories and sort of the, the bigger picture of like society. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the types of I movies find that, I uh, love to go. And yeah, filmmakers often explore maybe um, themes time and again, and maybe it's an unconscious thing, but they just find that there are elements that they like in stories and the stories that they're attracted to that end up showing up over and over in the stories that they make. 
Um, yeah, I just watched this um, documentary on Steven Spielberg, and he was talking about his proclivity for putting in, you know, broken families. Father figures that aren't there, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, it was really interesting. I, I saw a bunch of interviews with his father, with his father, and he was talking about how he um, um, he just wasn't there for the kids. You know, the, the mother had fallen in love with another man. Mm. But in order to keep things cool for the kids and not make paint the mom as a villain, they the two parents decided to tell uh, the kids that it was the dad that caused everything. So the dad took the heat. And so Spielberg for years was making films and acting out this young mm-hmm. uh, angst that he had and like an ET, it's a you know broken family and yeah. the mother's pissed at the dad. And I even heard famously in Close Encounters at the end of that movie, the dad leaves his family and like goes off with uh, the aliens and in an interview, Steven Spielberg said like, when I made that, I thought that was the coolest ending. Like, yeah, go explore the unknown uh, mysteries of the universe. And he's like, and then I grew up and had a family of my own. And he's like, I couldn't believe I wrote a story where yeah, dad just (laughs) abandons his children for the rest of their life. Like bye kids. And also like spending that amount of focus on broken families and then finally realizing like, Whoa, it was my mom that actually did it. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, but uh, you know. aside from Spielberg, are there are there elements that you? F- I mean, you say you like underdogs, but are there any other things that you feel like you're really attracted to in, in storytelling? You um, know, visual visual s- storytelling. Um, yeah, you know, the forger was difficult for me, and it was confusing because it had to deal with art forgery, and so each painting that the kid was forging, we had to have twenty different versions, and it was just complicated. Oh so gosh. I had some, yeah, I had some really good people help me keep track of all the different versions of the, of the paintings. Why would you stuff. need 20 versions of a painting for your film? You got to show it in different stages. Oh, okay. yeah. Of different course. Stages of, okay. So what they'll do is they'll actually take the, take the painting and they'll, um, they'll copy it, make a print out of it. Mm-hmm. And then they'll Photoshop and mm-hmm. remove parts of it uh, and turn it back into white canvas. Um, wow. so they'll take the finished painting and then remove parts of it and unfinish it. So Alex Tabularis did that, our production designer, and he's amazing. He's he just finished work for uh, Coppola, doing a bunch of uh, murals. Cool. Yeah, for a new Coppola project, nice. and um, you know, drew the first Darth Vader and created the words that fly away from you in Star yeah. Wars. So I was in good hands. But then Diablo was a lot of fun, even though I didn't really particularly care too much for the story. That was Scott Eastwood's decisions, how he how he wanted the story to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I loved the fact of being out in the woods with. You know, it was beautiful. 20 semis, beautiful and 100 people and a bunch of guns and, you know, horses and motorbikes and just, you know, it was fun. Uh, Inaritu too. Uh, Alejandro Inaritu was shooting Revenant across the river. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'd fly my drone over and, and <laughs> check out the set and they'd, they'd be like trying to throw rocks at the drone. Get out of here. Uh-oh. You know, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> a little turf war. Oh. No, nah, I would never turf war with that guy. I was just, you <laughs> yeah. know, young, young, dumb filmmaker trying to check out what was going on over there with my little drone. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, personally, what I'm really interested in is uh, you mentioned that you made like skate videos and snowboard videos when you were younger. Was that, um, were those creative endeavors or were those more just like skate you know a lot of skater kids just want to film themselves and have fun was that the beginning of of being a filmmaker for you or was i that- from the very beginning like wanted my own movie company oh, you really? know and so i was pretending my that my little skateboard video videos you know shot on high eight that we were a movie company mm-hmm. we were rpg films you know and we made our our film every year and I was just going for it I, I wanted to, uh, to do it entrepreneurially I want in terms of like I wanted to make money I wanted to create a product and that was where my pride lay was in creating the product yeah so I've always been all about the completion and the plan like I just can't do anything where I don't know where I'm going if I know where I'm going and where the final end result is I can do whatever I want it's just You know, so I had to set a goal for myself. What is it that I wanted to do? And I wanted to make one film a year and I wanted to sell internationally and I wanted it to have some of the best skateboarders and snowboarders that I could find. Oh, really? And so, you know, it wasn't just filming my friends. It was like, you know, we started off shooting photos for photo class. Yeah. Um, You know, skateboarding and stuff like that. And I guess that's where the influence came from. But there was always a reason behind it. 
Did you, you know. find uh, success with those videos, with those skateboarding and snowboarding videos? You know, more than you would ever imagine. What's the most popular one that you made? Uh, the most, not the most profitable one, but the most popular one was uh, Search for Mountain Gym. Okay. And that was a, a remake, a kind of really loose remake of a skateboard movie called The Search for Animal Chin. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was just a fun cruise through Canada. It was about this mountain man that uh, had this special region in Canada that he controlled that had the best snowboarding, but he would start avalanches and kill So this, your, your snowboard films were fictional films, were like, like fictional film premise films. that would then segue into reality snowboarders, just... Yeah, well, Search for Mountain Jim had a, a Native American narrator. We actually got oh. an Indian chief to narrate it. Wow. So it was kind of tongue-in-cheek. It was yeah. fun. Yeah, he had awesome, a good time. Honestly. <laughs> yeah, it was totally it was totally cool. It's a very have creative to watch that on movie night. Creative movie and yeah. and it was fun because Blondie, you know, she gave me a song. She gave me that rap song that she did, Rapture. Cool. And I called up her management and they're like, "Yeah, Blondie says that you can use the music and blah blah blah." And they go, "By the way, did you know that uh, KRS-One is doing a remix?" of this right now and I'm like no I had no idea and they 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 said oh that's I thought why you wanted to use the song I'm like no I just love the song <laughs> I love Blondie you yeah know? she's like she if, of all the artists from that era she would get what the snowboarders were doing yeah you know? very so cool yeah. um that's just great. on a personal level I am younger than you guys I grew up in the 90s and skate videos had a huge influence on me wanting to become a filmmaker. And did you skate at all? I was a very overweight kid, so I had a skateboard, but and didn't really so know how to use now. it. I want to see photos. Yeah. Of you. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh, I, I was see. huge. I would rollerblade really? and like ride my bike, but my friends, you know, we all wanted to be cool. So, so. you're a fruit booter. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh yeah. What's That's a, a derogatory booter? term. That's what, you know, skateboarders are cool and rollerbladers are lame. So, uh, oh yeah. We give like, you guys so much. Yeah. Food. Uh, and rightfully so, you do really deserve it. Yeah, where's the relating today? It's nowhere. Like it I went away. Down on that uh, one. It didn't have oh, lasting totally. power. <laughs> it wasn't as cool as skateboarding. But for me, uh, there were movies like uh, Church of Skatin was this skate film that my friends were obsessed with, and Jackass. And what's funny is I discovered directors like Spike Jones, uh, who started making skate videos as well. Yeah, I mean Spike Jones was a real interesting guy. He actually did um, uh, he did cartoons. He was an illustrator, and he did cartoons for both BMX, like Rad BMX or BMX Rad magazine, and then also, too, for uh, skateboarding magazine. So he kind of straddled both of those worlds. And I remember him from many, many, many years ago when I was a kid. And so, okay, so you like the whole jackass kind of generation, but there's their predecessors to those guys. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know? And the predecessors that were from snowboarding, they're called the Whiskey Crew. And it's this guy, Sean Kearns and Sean Johnson. They're two Canadian snowboarders. And they made a series of movies way before Jackass. And they were gnarly. They were almost gnarlier than, uh, than Jackass. They had this character called Boozy the Clown. And it was a clown that would everybody would wear the clown outfit. And if you wore the clown outfit, you had to do something crazy. So they have guys like doing a backflip off a roof onto their bare like feet or like yeah. regular feet, oh. you know, and breaking both their ankles or they'll have a guy ah. doing a 720 over a huge, like hundred foot road gap in a snowboard video. Like, and so, and their claim to fame was smashing bottles over their heads. Yeah. That's what they would do. Oh, and boy. so the, I'm not that saying that the jackass the guys saw the whiskey guys and copied them, but there were predecessors to whiskey. Absolutely. I mean, to jackass that was kind of. And so MTV could take a look at that. They saw this kind of thread in youth culture and they're like, Hey, I think the show will go. We just got to put the skull and crossbones in the beginning and tell people, Hey, don't try this at home. Otherwise we're going to get people sending us all kinds of videos. Yeah. Which was a problem too. And it's interesting because, uh, there was that snowboarding group. There was Jackass. There was Spike Jones. There's almost like this school of filmmakers that come from being idiots <laughs> you know yeah like, totally i do mega 64 and that's um it's a prank channel on youtube all around video games but it's kind of inspired by jackass and so i think we fall into that school of filmmaking too where we didn't go to film school but there was just a lot of raw energy and a lot of like let's film stuff and film our crazy ideas and put it out there and you know i think that comes from like traditional media that we grew up with was so like hammered 
like down, like just jam down your throat. Like, okay, all the sitcoms, uh, Three's Company, you know, all those different, all in the family. I'm talking about stuff mm -hmm. that's probably a little bit previous to you. But yeah. we were, like, by the time our generation was starting to grow up, we were just sick of traditional media. And pranks are fun. And what are you going to do with your skateboard buddies is you're going to go out, you're going to break things, you're going to you play pranks on people. So I think that it was like uh, the youth just searching for a new way to to, to entertain themselves and entertain other people. So, Absolutely. you know, Mega 64 definitely comes from that, that bloodline of, of kids just being tired of seeing the same old bullshit, you know? Yeah. And so you created, you create these, you know, fun video game spoofs and like act them out and stuff like that. People and then, took to it. and people, yeah, people took to it, you know? So you guys found your success by doing the counterintuitive thing. So you're doing these uh, snowboard videos. You're young. They're really successful. What what happened to it all? Like uh, the X Games came along. Oh really? Yeah, because okay, you got all these snow small snowboard companies, and they're you know we used to uh, finance my snowboard movies by getting ten grand from like ten different sponsors. Okay. Right, and then mm -hmm. we would they would pay for the movie, and then we would go out and shoot the movie, and then we'd sell it, and then that money that would come in. That was, you know, what we lived off of, and you know, uh, that was that was our income. And so, um, where am I going with this? Now, was this just you, or you're X saying games. we? Was there a crew? Did you have a team with you, you and your buddies? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I hung out with pro snowboarders, oh, okay. so it was me and a bunch of pro snowboarders, you know. And then every once in a while, there'd be a guy that we like to hang out with, but he maybe couldn't ride as well as the other guys, and I'd get them to help carry the camera bags oh. or help film a little bit. But the X Games came along and, and really ended it for me because all of the money um, out of, you know, what the sponsors would give us, they started spending on getting their riders into the X Games. Mm -hmm. They figured if we put $100,000, send this guy to the X Games, and, um, and he gets on TV and 20, 30 million kids see it, that's better than Lawrence Rock's, you know, 10,000 people seeing his snowboard video. Yeah. The numbers were so astronomically different. And by that time, I tell you, Derek, it was like I had to get out of it. It was dangerous. I was 25. I'd spent six years doing it. And I could only see myself going deeper and deeper in an art form that didn't want classic storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, they just wanted music and... and cool and, tricks. Yeah, cool tricks. And I wanted to tell stories. So... Leaving snowboarding and going into shooting news was the best thing I could have ever done. You know, it was a lot of fun. Wow, that's a hard turn from snowboarding, fun, recreational to... But it was, it was interesting, like, uh, when I applied for the job, I'm applying with this lady, Delia Maldonado, and she's like this tough Hispanic news lady, you know? And, but she's kind of got like this little crinkle in her eye, so she's kind of laughing at everything around her, but she's tough. Mm -hmm. And she looks at me and she goes, well, you don't look like a news guy. And I go, well, I don't really know what they look like, but I'm happy to wear different clothing <laughs> or, or, or you know, I'll present myself any way you want. I Just can... let me know what you want. And she goes, and she goes, well, what, why should I hire you? And I handed her my five snowboard videos and I go, cause I made these. And if I can make these, I can make anything that you want me to, you know? And True. she goes, she goes, you know what? I'll, okay, I'll, I'll take a chance on you. If you can oh. figure out how to make a snowboard video, you can probably figure out how to shoot a news story. And shooting news was great. Like for any young filmmaker that wants to get into filmmaking and really learn their craft, go be a news cameraman, you know? It's not boring, You're, it's always exciting, and you get the best camera out there. They'll give you a $30,000, $40,000 camera mm, to use in a nice. news truck. You only get paid like $12 an hour unless you're like in LA in a bigger market and then good luck getting that job. Huh. But you learn editing and you learn all these skills and, and you learn people skills too. You learn how the community works. And that in a weird sort of way helped me out the most in becoming a feature filmmaker was shooting news and learning how the community worked and just getting to know people and learning how to navigate stuff. You know. Yeah. I've heard certain film professors say it's important to study film, obviously, but you have to study other things like humanities and you need to understand people because being a good editor and work, knowing how to work a camera will take you so far, but 
you need to really understand people to make a good film. Yeah, I had this conversation with a with a producer in um, in Los Angeles the other day, and basically we're we're talking about my influences, and I, I told him I said I'm really drawn to like the Spielbergs, the Clint Eastwoods of the industry, and he goes, "Why? You know, there's so many other great filmmakers," and I go, "I like them." because they're great filmmakers, but they're also great business people and they understand how the business works. And that's how they are able to maintain such large organizations. Steven Spielberg knows how the accounting works at a movie company. He knows how the legal structure works. He knows how to put all that stuff together, but yet he's a filmmaker. So being multifaceted yeah. can make you way stronger. And I think Jody, you well, can attest to that. your creativity too, if you can. If you live other experiences, because it's not just technical, you can point a camera at anything, but there's the creative element to it. And if you haven't really lived a lot of different experiences, it limits, you know, your vision in mm-hmm. the, to, a, to a large degree. And, you know, I studied sociology, women's studies, I've studied cooking, uh, I've done all sorts of things that feed into who I am as a filmmaker today. You know, just what's important, what, you know, just the details the little elements of of, of film that uh, maybe other people would miss if they didn't have a more broad experience. Yeah, and you know if you if you if you live an interesting life, you're going to make interesting films. You know, that's yeah, good quote. <laughs> that's but great. also, that's too, true. you got you know everybody's different. I hear Quentin Tarantino, you know, isn't a super adventurous guy. He's not out there. You know, skydiving or hang that glide. I may be wrong, but you know, or or you know, traveling to tons of different countries. And I hear he's more insular, but he's watches so much movies. He gets his inspiration from other movies. That's why Mm. you see him uh, mimicking other filmmakers in in his films, is because he's paying homage to those different things. And me, I I like to travel. You know, like right now, I'm living in Mexico uh, for a couple months, which is really fascinating you know, um, and trying to learn the language it's because we're doing an um, international uh, uh, action-adventure science fiction movie in Mexico. I, I want to understand the place. And I think the movie will just be better if you invest in it. And there's like this intangible thing. Like, you know, my family thinks I'm nuts. They're like, you're moving to Mexico oh, for this movie. Yes. And I'm like, yeah. And they're all like, well, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, well, you don't understand what I do for a living. It's like you immerse yourself in a subject so that when you go and talk about that subject, you actually know something about it. You know, why are the cops' lights in Tijuana always on? Why, um, you know, why do they do the trash the way they do with, the, with guys driving around and honking every single stop? Like, uh, the tiniest little idiosyncrasies in the society. The guy yelling into his little yeah, speaker every morning at 6 a.m. Totally, exactly. <laughs> That's a great detail. And the smallest idiosyncrasies in society are kind of tell you the bigger story. Yeah. And tell you the real yeah. understanding. It's like like Roma, this film that uh, Alfonso Cuaron is releasing right now. I have not seen it, but it's about a Mexican housekeeper. But people are saying it's such an incredible film. It's because he's taking a very minute look at something small that is indicative of larger society. That's good filmmaking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? uh, and he's Mexican, so he's making a film about the culture he comes from. He's very familiar with Yeah, that. which is awesome. Well, yeah. and I think as an American, just to finish, or just to piggyback on what you said, as an American in, in Mexico, you get a radically different experience, which is very, you know, very interesting. You don't always get that type of uh, film where you get sort of... Yeah, half of what I see, I just don't understand. It's <laughs> so interesting. I've seen... Got to spend more time down there. <laughs> I've seen it. I've just seen such trippy stuff down there. I'm like, why do they do it? There's a reason for everything. It's just a different culture. Yeah. And, you know, if you don't gain that, that nuance and that inflection of, uh, and view of, like, you know, the inflection of society there, you're, you're going to end up directing something that's really on the surface and kind of doesn't get deep. And even though someone may not know all the details of Mexico, human beings are pretty intuitive and they can tell when you're going deep. It's about ringing true. Yeah, it's about yeah. Ringing people, true, exactly. Yeah, people don't know that it's real, but it feels real to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you uh, you're kind of where a lot of people would like to be in their career. You've had you have two films under your belt, big films. There's a lot of people that are in a place where I'd like to be in my career. Yeah, so everybody's on the ladder somewhere. <laughs> it's I think, a spectrum. Um, 
what would you tell people after you made your first film moving into Diablo and now you're working on your third? Were there lessons that you felt like you can only learn this by making a film? Were there things moving into your second film that, that were know, totally it, different the way you approached them from your first? It's interesting. You know, I thought that, um, that making a movie and, you know, my first day shooting um, for The Forger was my first day on a movie set, a real movie set. Um, cause I, you know, I'd worked for Clint Eastwood. Oh, it's kind of like a sweet notion, like, like, a endearing this first man, you step onto the movie set for the first time. You're running the show. It was terrifying. <laughs> uh, but no, I'd, I had worked for, I had worked for Clint Eastwood for many years and, and Dina Eastwood, both, you know, both of them, the family members and the family and had done a lot of documentary projects. So I, you know, I understood, I understood filmmaking, but, um, you know, you come into, you come onto your first set and you think, oh, it's just the happy-go-lucky family and we're all into this, but you start to soon realize that there's a lot of divisions in, in uh, a production environment. You know, um, sometimes you have people that don't work in creative positions like the, you know, the gaffers and the grips and stuff like that. Well, the gaffers are a creative position, but the grips and the truck drivers, they, they just don't care about, mm -hmm. like, the, some of them do, I'm sure, but they're there. They're just there to drive a truck. You know, they're there to do their job and, and get a paycheck. Uh, the UPM uh, unit production manager usually has a certain amount of animosity, uh, latent animosity towards the creatives on the production because we present problems and they just want to get things done. Mm, okay. You know, and I've seen and noticed that sort of thing, and I've made a real cognizant decision that when I hire a UPM, I don't want them to have. Uh, underlying animosity towards the creatives in the project, you know, and I and I want the creatives in the project to have an underlying respect for the people that are doing the job and moving the trucks and moving the lights and stuff like that. Because I've seen actors lash out at the workmen, and I was shocked. I'm like, you're getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to be here for 30 days, and this guy's getting paid 15, 20 bucks an hour to move these heavy lights. Can't you just be respectful to them? Can't mm. you be nice? This was a, one of the first, not kind of a negative, but like seeing how there is certain disrespect. So I made a decision uh, with Jody here because um, uh, she's my producer on my next movie with me. But to have a zero tolerance production, like everybody treats everybody respectfully, everybody's nice, top to bottom, and we, uh, you know, just won't tolerate anything else. And so that was a big thing. I, Breath I of learned. fresh air. Yeah, that's the thing I learned on my on my first production. That's cool. And you know, you you have this you have this like rose colored glasses view of things. I think everybody's going to be your buddy on the movie. It's like no, you're you're the director and you're the producer, and so you you fulfill a, an authority figure role. So the crew doesn't really want to party you that uh, party with you that night. You know, they want to go out with 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 their own. Yeah, you know? like the dad. Yeah, you're kind of like the dad. So, you know, they'll let you in. You know, when you throw the rap party at the end of the movie or whatever, you're all partying together because you're celebrating this accomplishment. But you you fulfill an authority role. Hierarchy, yeah. and, you should, okay. and you should almost sit into it and, and be that thing. Like, I shouldn't be trying to party with the crew and be buddies with everybody because they got to have a certain amount of authority, you know? Yeah. Then the other thing I didn't realize, the last thing is that, you know, the producer and the director of a movie, if something happens like some big accident and somebody dies i could be criminally liable for that mm. if i was negligent there was a girl um i can't remember her name sad that i can't but she was working on an independent film somewhere on the east coast and she got hit by a train mm -hmm. and uh, uh -huh. it was I actually the that. debris yeah from from <clears throat> the train hit and then that killed her and those producers, and I believe the director, they went to jail for a little bit. They didn't know? have, I don't think they had permits or something was on. They didn't have permits, something stupid. Like they, they just dropped the ball and tried little to little paperwork Fact check us, please. We're going to shoot on an airplane tarmac. There's 747s <laughs> around, but we're not going to clear any of this. You know, it was just dumb what they did. I mean, oh, it was boy. a train track. But so I guess the last thing I could say is that I didn't realize the amount of responsibility, human responsibility you have to people when I made a movie. It's a, it's a major endeavor and you're on the hook for other people's lives. So you got to take it seriously. That's interesting uh, because I feel like a lot of creative types, especially shy away from confrontation. 
you know, these creative filmmakers and musicians and writers, they're very emotional, they're very sensitive, you know, so it takes a little bit of authority. Suck and it up, some, buttercup. Yeah, some gruff to you be gotta, the... You got, a, you got a scene to run. You know, Clint Eastwood's tough. Steven Spielberg's tough. I'm sure these they are. people, you know, yeah. there's a tough core to them, and, and they're able to go out and go get their movie made and, and push through. And you have to have, like, you know, the soft, sensitive artist. It's fine if you're, you know, doing watercolors at home, but, like, <laughs> you know, on a movie set, it's like you got to be a leader. You got to be a general. You got bossy truck drivers around and... Hopefully the UPM will do that. <laughs> you know, you got that that uh, degree of separation, but uh, it, it is it is a tough job. Yeah. And there's millions of dollars on the line. There's investors. You got to take it really seriously. Um, definitely. Okay, I want to change gears a little bit and just talk about what was the what were some of the early movies you saw growing up, or what made you want to be a filmmaker? Was there a movie that really awoken uh, in you a desire to go into movies? Um, I wouldn't say it was one particular film. It was just the nature of what it was. Um, I was like eight years old and I had a little black and white TV that, you know, I had set up in my room <laughs> with bunny ears. So I get like two channels and, uh, I was the youngest of three boys. My older brothers were a little bit older than me, so they didn't really hang out with me. And I lived in a forest, uh, called Pebble Beach and uh, was a couple miles away from my nearest friends. So I spent a lot of time by myself and, and watching that little black and white TV. And I was fascinated by who created the thing that's in the TV, mm. you know, from a very young age. So I wanted to be a director from like eight years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. But then, you know, you're growing up, you get into skateboarding, you don't really think about these things. And then you... You know, I got into snowboarding and then I wanted to make snowboard videos and then it all came full cir circle like that remembrance of what I wanted to do came back. And um, I don't think you can be a filmmaker unless you have a narrative drive, like a real desire to tell stories. Yeah. What do you think, Jody? What do you um, see? If I... Uh, I mean, stories are important. I think you got to kind of care about humanity on some level as well um and want to sort of show different perspectives uh i personally have always loved storytelling in various forms whether writing i loved photography i loved a lot of different things i just love how film brought a lot of that together into one art form yeah you know, i've always loved community to me you know community around it's really exciting and fun and enjoyable and helps you know, makes me want to make more films, even if they're not great films, just the process of it is really enjoyable for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably different for everyone, but yeah, if you want to direct something, me, I like lists and spreadsheets and checking things off and you like getting completion, things done. But you, like, but you like art though too. Yeah. And so I love, other, I love artists. I think art, if you show up at my house, you just see art from all over all my friends, my whole life, all my travels. I mean, I just love that type of uh, those people. I love the art. I love the I love the the ability that people have that is intangible to me. Like blows my mind sometimes what people are able to come up with. You remind me kind of of a UPM because UPM unit production managers they like they make sure the trucks are there and all the stuff and everything's rolling. But they're there so they do this technical thing. But the movie wouldn't survive without it. So it's like the infrastructure support. And then they're creative in a wholly different way. Yeah. It's, you know, they're creative in how they're going to pull it off. And that's kind of what I see with you. Yeah. It's like puzzle pieces and working them out and getting everything. Yeah. It's all a puzzle. And once you figure it out, like uh, Richard Dreyfus, our, uh, our San Diego local resident here from Encinitas. But Richard Dreyfus said this real interesting thing about filmmaking. It's just problem solving. Oh, so much. Constantly solving that's what I problems. Say. Right now, our problem we're trying to solve is um, how do we strike a distribution deal with the few deals that we're being offered right now and make sure that it's right and that we're not giving oh, the movie goodness, away yeah. forever. It's really and, important. Yeah. And so we're just solving make this. make or break the film. So you so, have to be. Yeah. So we're solving this current problem, right? Once that problem is solved, um, then we're going to go back into casting. Uh, but, you know, I didn't feel comfortable spending all this money on casting movie stars 
until I have my distribution deal kind of figured out, you know? So sometimes I'll do things two steps ahead and then got to back up one step and then I'll jump forward 10 steps. But, you know, it really comes down to, um, really comes down. I don't know. What I like, what I like that you do, Lawrence, (laughs) is you sort of play out each scenario to, to where, you know, potential paths that a certain scenario would take us yeah. down yeah. and that, and you sort of, and you, you problem solve before the problems even there sometimes try to <laughs> you're like, you're like this, this happens. Okay. This dis- distribution deal. But if, if it turns out this way, this could be a problem down the line. So you, you really have a lot of, uh, what's the word when you, I'd say vision, but I, I'm, I mean like for, insight, foresight, foresight into think, yeah, the potential. I was going to say schizophrenia. <laughs> <laughs> the ability to cross bridges in your mind before you <laughs> arrive there physically. Yes. Well, you, there's certain, it's like Tetris. It's like the blocks only go together certain ways. You know, when you see certain patterns forming, you start figuring it out. You know, we started spending money in casting. And we're, we're going after the biggest stars in the world. Yes. And we're still going to do that. But for one hot minute, we got to sit back and figure out our distribution deal. And the best one, the one that's the not. best one that we want to take. And let's and talk what's about distribution a little bit. I find it interesting because I think every uh, filmmaker has a different approach, like their first step into films. Some people it's visual, some people it's the writing. And I gather from Lawrence, it's, uh, it's, ref- it's cool. It's, there's a business plan here, even going back and talking about your snowboarding videos and how are you getting, you were yes. getting them funded from multiple companies. At 19 years old, I feel like that's a lot of... That's advanced level. Forethought, yeah. For somebody who's a teenager to approach these companies, say, fund my film. Uh, and have it work. If you don't have an idea <laughs> yeah. of how you fit into the world and what people need of you to give you the things that you need to go be <laughs> successful, you can't survive yeah. in this industry. And, and most filmmakers won't. don't. I feel like they don't care about that. They just want to make their film and they make it. They all, well, look, the, this is my opinion. Out later. They yeah, all, they all, later. The, my opinion is this, that all, the majority, 99.9% filmmakers all view themselves as extremely talented and they can't wait to show the world what they can do. And that's fine. But if you want to, um, if you're not that one in 3,000 or one in a million or whatever the number is that makes you so special, why don't you at least give yourself a fighting chance of surviving? And who's to say that your first movie is going to get into Sundance? Like, what if your first film just doesn't have ha- have it? And what are you going to do? Well, you got to go make another one, and you got to keep figuring things out and figuring out how you fit into the market. So when I went to go make my first movie, I started off by, and again, I was working for the Eastwood family, so I had some great influences. But, you know, I had to be the filmmaker. I had to step through the door and be that person on the other side. Working for the Eastwoods wasn't going to do anything for me. It wasn't going to help me direct the movie or make a good movie. So I realized right off the bat, hey, we're either going to make a tiny little film, which is a calling card. You know, Forger was originally going to be $50,000. I think wow. now the budget's reported it's $12 million. <laughs> so you can imagine the disparity between those two. But once we started to realize, like, hey, we can go get a big star for this thing. Hey, this person, Josh Hutcherson, wants to be in it. I had to build very quickly a business plan of, like, where is this movie going? How much money is it going to take to make it? And what do I want to see it do in the marketplace? And so having, you know... Josh Hutcherson was fantastic. And then I got Hayden Panettiere and I had Lauren Bacall. I almost had too many stars in the first one. <laughs> it was a little ridiculous. Star-studded you event. Had too many stars in both of them. It's kind of but, amazing, actually. Ridiculous the, is not the word I would go with. But the thing is, is we did it for a very specific reason because the distributor... Now, people will argue with me on this, and they may be correct, but I believe this to be true. The distributor really doesn't care how good your movie is. They care how well it will sell because mm-hmm. they're there to make money. There's certain art, artsy fartsy distributors that really care about the quality of the movie and they want to do your indie film distribution because they think it's so cool. Yeah. But good luck finding one of those and showing them to me. <laughs> they all want to make money. So I was like, I got to make a product. If I'm going to make an international art forgery movie, which is kind of artsy fartsy, I got to put some stars in it. Oh, yeah. And it's got to take place in a beautiful place. Mm hmm. And, and, and me as a director, if this is going to be my first movie and my first days on set, I better have really experienced people around me to keep me from getting in trouble. So the movie turned out well. It wasn't the best film in the world, but any filmmaker that says they made the best movie in the world, I, I think you got an ego problem. You know? <laughs> 
But probably. Yeah, probably. probably. But at least, look, having a vision as a filmmaker is so important because I live off of that film. People remember Lauren Bacall and they go, holy shit, you directed Lauren Bacall's last movie. It's a nice calling card to have. So when I went to go do Diablo, it made sense to the investors to put up the six million bucks to do it because Mm -hmm. we had a vision we showed scope and repeatability. And those are two words I uh, catchphrase. That's a catchphrase I got from one of my investors. He was a you know big time financial guy. He goes, I like investing in you because you have scope. You're trying to do something big, and you have repeatability. If this movie really takes off, uh, you know um, we can do more of these. But um, anyways, nice. Yeah. Um, well, that I mean, I feel like that covers all my questions for Lawrence. Is there any <laughs> any other? Do what do you anything? got for me, Jody? Do you yeah, have what anything? Do you got, Jody? What's my favorite color? Burning. Mauve. What was your um, what was the craziest video that you made prior to all the movies? Like, what's a video that kind of did something, or was successful in a way that just was surprising and shocking, or just was a fun experience? I'm thinking of that. Was it Jurassic Five video that you showed me? The streets of L.A. That was fun. Yeah, I I knew these guys. Uh, So I go to L.A. and I'm working for this music video group. Um, No, it's a band management company called Silverback Management. And this is kind of funny. This is how my life always works out. I just randomly meet people. It's like meeting Clint Eastwood at a wedding and end up working with his wife and him for 10 years. So I'm, I'm in L.A. I'm working for Silverback Management, and they managed uh, Sublime and Slightly Stupid and Fishbone and all these great you know, rock reggae bands, famous bands. And um, I'm doing music videos for them, smaller ones, mm-hmm. and I'm still doing freelance commercial projects. And I go, hey, I want to do some of these bigger MTV you know, movie, music videos, $50,000 budget, $100,000 budget. Oh, we can't help you out. We don't, you know, the, the people we know, they won't take you. You know, you're too new, this, that, and the other thing. So long story short, I'm in the hot tub in my building, and this guy gets in the hot tub, and I'm looking at him, and he looks real familiar. And I'm like, hey, are you Brian Lottie? Uh, He's a famous skateboarder from Las Vegas, skateboarder for planet Earth. And he goes, yeah, I am. I go, oh, shit. Well, you know, I'm a a skateboarder, too, and I make videos. I'm a director, and da-da-da-da-da. And uh, he's all making a skateboard movie. Right, and I'm okay. like, okay, cool. Well, can I film for you? I, I'll I'll donate some days, and he's like, ah, we, you know, you can't keep up. We're professionals and all this stuff, and and I've been skateboarding all my life. So I showed up at his house uh, or his his apartment with a six pack of beer and a, and a videotape, a VHS tape at the time of some skateboarding I filmed, and he ended up watching it and he realized like, hey, Lawrence knows how to skateboard. He can do this stuff, and so. He was making a skateboard movie with the Malloy brothers. And the Malloy brothers were directing um, Metallica videos, Blink-182. Oh, cool. They were doing all the big nice. ones at that time. And so, oddly enough, my friends in the music industry that I worked with couldn't connect me with the Malloys. I connected myself with them. And they huh. were the top, hot tub meeting. Yeah, about that? the top <laughs> video makers in, in the world. Yeah. Music video makers in the world at that time. And so they called me up and they're like, hey, we got this project. We're going to have George Bush running through downtown um, uh, L.A. And the song's called Work It Out. It's Jurassic Five and Dave Matthews sings the hook. You know, you, are you okay. into doing it? And so through skateboarding and sitting in the hot tub meeting this guy, I ended up getting that gig, you know. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun, man. We had a full motorcade downtown L.A. Everybody hated George Bush at the time. People thought it was him, actually, and were flipping him off and throwing stuff out of the windows. <laughs> yeah. Other people were pointing, and we, we were filming all the, all the uh, reactions in the windows and stuff like that, and it was a really fun shoot. And then I would say probably the other craziest one was... Um, Is that music video available online? Can yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just look it up. Jurassic okay. 5, Dave Matthews, and it's called Work It Out. Okay. It's in there. We'll provide a link when we put this podcast up. Yeah, and yeah. I probably shot like 40% of it, so I shot a bunch of it. I didn't direct it. The Malloy brothers directed it. 
But one thing I did direct that was interesting was um, a video with Reese Witherspoon for the Make a Wish Foundation, oh. and you're familiar with that. You know, yeah, kids that have a, yeah. a terminal, terminal illness, they get a they get a wish, and she had given a wish out to a young girl that had brain cancer and was dying, and the girl loved Legally Blonde, and it wasn't a crazy shoot; it was just a really interesting shoot. Because I got to film with Reese Witherspoon, but she was at that time, that day, like, you know, telling Dina Eastwood, like, I'm divorcing my husband. And so it was extremely emotional. And we're filming this, this, you know, this interview about this girl and she's talking about this stuff and her emotions were really on the surface. Mm. And she just starts crying during the interview. It was very moving and like interesting, Mm. you know, and, uh. And just seeing a talent like that, Reese Witherspoon was, you know, amazing, still is, amazing producer and, and talent. And then, uh, I don't know, like the craziest, craziest thing we ever did is we did a demolition derby years ago, many years ago. <laughs> and years. We, we had a demolition derby and then we towed all the cars into a pile and then blew them up with uh, explosive devices and propane canisters and fire. Oh my gosh, that's and, great. And it was the end of my snowboard movie. And so my dad, who was 74 at the time, we couldn't figure out, we had fuses going into the gas tank of the car and lighting them and thinking like in a movie they blow up. Oh, that's yeah. My works. dad comes out, he's eating a hot dog, he's got his camera around his neck, he's wearing you know, his, his OP shirt and sandals and khaki pants like uh-huh. you know 74 year old german dude and he goes you boys you do not know how to blow anything up <laughs> and he goes over there and just pours gas all over the engine lights it on fire chucks a propane canister give me the shotgun boom and the thing went up like 60 feet and he's all that's how you light things on fire wow. just walks away i'm like dad <laughs> that's a yeah. crazy story it was a lot of fun it was a lot of my brother burned his arm, but um, anyways. <laughs> well, okay, I got two more questions. Tell me about how you met Clint Eastwood. You sort of alluded to it, but I think it's a great little story. Well, you know, my main my main person within the family that I interacted with was always Dina, and so I got to give her credit. Dina was the lady that you know shepherded all the projects within the family. She was the lady that I worked with and everything, but that relationship came um, you know through meeting Clint at a wedding. And so I was shooting a wedding video, and, my, and I was a news photographer at the time, and I, I'd make 12 bucks an hour, and I could shoot wedding videos and make like two, three grand a weekend. So I was like, oh, I'm going to do this on the weekends. My colleagues all made fun of me. They're all, oh, you'll never get anywhere doing that. I don't know why you're doing it. But I would take the money, and I would dump it into whatever music video I was doing. And so um, I was shooting a wedding video. I run up to my truck to go get a camera, I mean, get a tape. I run back down to, yeah, when we had tapes and cameras, ran down to the wedding and there was Clint Eastwood looking through my camera, pretending he was the wedding videographer. And all the guests are friends of his walking in and thinking that's hilarious. I thought it was funny, you know, and I just, I asked myself in that moment, like, what do you do? So I went out and chatted with him and told him a little joke about, you know, where we should put the camera and uh, chatted with them. And I ended up working for Dina and, and, and Mr. Eastwood for, for a number of years. And, and Dina was really the person that I interacted with most because he was so busy just making movies and stuff like that. But then she would set up a shoot. He would come in. He would play piano for like a Make-A-Wish Foundation piece or do voiceover for a PSA. I mean, we did so many things, dozens and dozens of projects. What are some of the things you learned working with him? Working with him? him? Oh, just know your stuff. When you got talent on set and they're important, you got to be prepared and you got to have a vision. Mm. Words of advice from him came in small little bursts. Uh, um, You know, I would ask him a question and he would give me a very succinct, short answer. You know, Mr. Eastwood, um, what do you think is uh, the secret to having a long career? Just keep going. Because if you keep going at some point, the spotlight of the industry will shine on you and you're ready for that moment. And, you know, things happen, you know, he was very close like that. And one time I was directing him in the Eastwood factor and we're sitting at the, we're standing at the beach and we have to sit him down for an interview. And he goes, well, where do you want me to sit for the interview? And I go, well, I don't know. Where do you want to sit? And he, the most important thing he ever said, he said, you're the director. You tell me where to go. 
you know, I'll give you an idea maybe, but, and I go, well, sit over here on this rock, grab this piece of seaweed. When you feel like you're getting towards the end of your conversation, you know, and you're tearing the seaweed apart in your hands, toss it at the camera like a que sera, sera <laughs> kind of moment. And he did that and he nailed it. And I was like, this guy listens to uh, me. This guy knows how to act. And he knows how to act. Amazing. He should be an actor. <laughs> you know? That and he was like 80 something, uh, 82 at the time and running up and down Carmel Beach. It was, you know, he was a lot of fun to work with. Uh, so you were with the Eastwoods for 10 years. Um, where, what were some of the, were you involved in any of the films that Clint Eastwood was working on? No, I did not work for Mal Paso, nor did I have any connection with Mal Paso. Oh, I was okay. very so much removed. With, with I worked for him and Dina. Okay. Yeah. And it was Dina really mostly giving the directive, you know, my job was to be the best creative video producer director that I could be, yeah. whatever it was, knock it out of the park and do something exceptional. So I really loved that challenge. Like they did this one thing. Dina hired me to shoot a documentary about his mother and him and their relationship together. So I went up to the little town of, um, I think it's Tascadero, somewhere up in, up in the Bay Area right next to, um, right next to Oakland. Okay. And, you know, I went and filmed his childhood home, you know. I shot a bunch of interviews with neighbors that, you know, I never used, but, uh -huh. you know, I was always trying to go over, over the top, but be honest. not to impress them, but just to do the best work possible. Sure. You know? Okay. That's yeah. great. Um, what was the, what was the nature of the projects other than like doc? Was it just when they would have a personal thing and they needed a cameraman, they would, you were their go-to guy? Or? Yeah. Sometimes they'd have a, um, you know, an event oh, okay. like John McCain, the Senator, Oh, you know, ran for president. He would come to town and uh, they were like, hey, can you film this event for us and oh, then cool. film it? And then, you know, we'll make a video and we'll email it to our top donors or something like that. So that on a smaller level then on a bigger level, you know, when, when Mr. Eastwood was doing Invictus, they had found a boy band in South Africa that ended up singing a cappella. A lot of the music for the movie. Mm. Beautiful voices. Really? Seven, seven singers from South Africa. They were called Overtone. Now defunct but they, um, were, they were together at that time. And um, I got to you know, live at the house uh, down in Bel Air. I don't even know if Mr. Eastwood knows this, but for, that I was there for that long, but I was there for like six months, you know, living with that band at that house and filming, filming them do the soundtrack uh, in the laundry room of Clint's house. Oh, you know? real behind the scenes. Oh yeah. Yeah, he's real. Room. Yeah, totally. We were in the laundry room and it had seven singers all singing into one mic. And the funny thing is you watch the movie and you think that you shot it in some like, you know, or recorded this in some incredible studio. But it <laughs> it's not a lot. So even room. when Clint Eastwood makes a movie, it's like, let's get the audio from the laundry room. <laughs> like, That's a, yeah, I mean, a great story about the mule, the new one is, I, I don't know who the country singer is, but the country singer, you know, uh, met him while they were playing a golf tournament in Pebble Beach. And ended up uh, writing a song for the for the mule called uh, "Don't Let the Old Man In," mm -hmm. and so the country singer was real sick. I think it was Toby Keith or Toby, yeah, Toby Keith or something like that. I don't know. Country fans, don't be mad at me. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, he sang the song, but he was really sick, and he did a real tired, kind of raspy version of it. Yeah, that's the one that Mr. Eastwood chose. So he likes the lo-fi. He likes that raw energy, mm. huh? Yeah, and, and he said one, something to me once that really resonated with me, and that was um, uh, the beauty is in the imperfection. Yeah, okay. So things don't have to be perfect. Yeah, I love that. I agree. I agree. You know, Marvel movies, they bore me because they're so per I saw Aquaman. I slept through 45 minutes of it. I woke up. I knew exactly where we were, what was going on in the movie, and it was just boring to me. I, uh, I feel the same way. I feel it's almost too glossy. I, I check out mentally. Like, yeah, everything's perfect, you know. Yeah, so back... So I stopped paying attention. <laughs> so back to, you know, the movie I'm producing right now uh, that I'm going to shoot in, in Mexico um, with Jody. Um, that, that movie is all about imperfection and and the rawness and things that aren't necessarily perfect, but are the way they are. 
and the the facts just are describes to wanna yeah have tea. the grittiness the realness yeah I want it endemic to like where we're shooting it you know just make don't make it look so perfect yeah I love it I love it well we are uh, over an hour here with this conversation so I think that about wraps it up. Cool. Thanks for having right. me, guys. I appreciate being on the Film Consortium podcast. And hey, can't thank wait you. To yeah, hear more of these. We yes. will have you back again in the future. Yes. If you're not too famous to come talk to us yeah. after the next movie comes out. Don't forget to love people. <laughs> we'll well, you know, if you catch me in the next 20 years, I'll probably still be available. No, I'm just <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we were talking with Lawrence Rock, director of Diablo, The Forger, and a new movie coming out soon we didn't say the name of the movie the whole it's untitled time. right now untitled that's why well keep an untitled. eye out for lawrence come to a theater near you thank yeah, you thank, thank you for talking have a good one everyone bye yeah and jody bye bye bye